to rap or not to rap? That is the question Scott Woods and I will be pondering as we dig into the lyrics to Dead On It from Prince's The Black Album. Welcome back to the show, Scott. Oh, what a pleasure it is to be here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for agreeing to join me today to talk about Dead On It. That's uh, track three from the Black Album. It's really kind of Prince's, uh, for one of pr- early Prince's forays into rap music. Um, I think this song is is hilarious. Uh, <laughs> and, yeah. it's a, and, it, and it's a little... It's a little cringeworthy at times as well, <laughs> especially <laughs> listening, to, especially listening to it from a fan of 80s hip hop. I'm like, OK, what's he trying to what's he trying to say here? And that's really what I want to get to today is trying to figure out, like, what's Prince's angle in this song? What was his motivation for recording Dead on it? What was his what was his thought process? And then, you know, we'll never know for sure, but we can certainly theorize, I think. <laughs> yeah, Definitely. So Scott, Black Album. What is? Do you have any like history with this album? Like, do you have any Black Album stories you want to share with the listeners? A little context, I suppose. So, um, you know, when it was announced that he was recording such a record and going to release such a record, I was very excited. Um, you know, I was like, oh, it's it's going to be black, it's going to be funky, it's going to be all of these things. And then when he pulled it and gave us Love Sexy instead, I was very upset. I was upset, obviously, because I didn't get the record I was promised. And it was replaced with a record that I was on the fence about. So by the time I eventually got to the Black Album, it was several years later. And it was uh, a bootleg vinyl in a record store that I frequented. And... It was about the right price, right? It was only like 25 bucks or something at the time. This is adjusted for like 1989, $1990. I bought that obviously like immediately and took it home, put it on. And I instantly fell in love with this album. Um, it was so different and wild and raw. And of course the recording was not pristine, but um, I was just, completely enamored of that record right out the gate and and have been since yeah that's 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 basically my history with the album now mm-hmm. that it's out and like when it was eventually completely released and remastered and remastered again and you know that's all very nice and and I'm still finding things to enjoy about the record but that first bootleg vinyl was was where it was at with me mhm yeah i think a lot of people either a bootleg cassette or bootleg vinyl was the way to go the way to get this even if it was just like a recording of somebody else's bootleg somehow some way sharing it and and providing it to just to be able to listen to it i think was the whole point uh quality of of the recording wasn't quite as primarily important as just being able to hear it Mm mm-hmm well, so Dead On It is the song we're talking about. Uh, there isn't a lot of history recorded in Prince Vault about this song. There's not a lot of, like, known information. Uh, uh, Prince Vault does mention that it was recorded in March of 87, but we don't know exactly when he wrote it or, you know, like the time frame. I mean, we can kind of guess based off of some of the references in the song, but we don't know specifically exactly when it was written, but then again, we don't know when Prince wrote a lot of the song. We just know recording dates and, you know, when he was in the studio, which I guess in this case was March of 87. And it comes right after uh, Cindy C like LaGrind and Cindy C are two kind of really funky dance numbers to start the album off. Um, LaGrind is more of a typical house quake DMSR type song. Cindy C gets into a little more of the, um, melodrama that prince was kind of exhibiting on some of the songs in this album a little bit of um anger and resentment and a little you know uh, obsession with a particular woman in this case but then dead on it comes on right after that and it's a completely different song entirely it's it's it has like this really echoey hard drum beat drum machine beat to it that really mimics i think a lot of like the mid 80s hip hop sounds that were popular at the time when he probably wrote this and recorded the song and then he starts rapping and so you know it's not like the first time we've heard prince rap i mean he kind of raps a little bit i guess you can say on irresistible bitch 
he wrote a rap song pretty much for Sheila E with Holly Rock. So, but just to hear Prince just straight up rap. I mean, this isn't really anything but rap music, I don't think. Um, I mean, there's <laughs> there's there's like this the funky guitar that he puts in it in the song, but it's it's like a straight up hip hop song for the most part, with the exception of maybe the guitar. Although you know, artists like Run DMC were incorporating rock guitar into their their songs in the mid '80s as well, just to kind of you know cross over onto MTV or you know uh, mix the two um, the two worlds of rock and hip hop. So what what were your thoughts about this song in the context of when you heard it in the 80s, Scott? Well, let me begin by saying you're being very generous here. <laughs> <In terms of. laughs> I try to. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, my take on a lot of what was around this song and what this song was and what he was possibly trying to do, you know, I, I don't think that it is a coincidence that there isn't much information about this song in terms of its recording. I don't think he spent much time on it. So, um, <laughs> you know, my interpretation of this song has always been um, that he's technically writing a rap song, but he's doing it completely um, disingenuously, right? So he doesn't like what rap is doing at this time. And that's, you almost kind of get it really. Um, at the time that he was, you know, recording this song, rap was taking over radio, or at least it was becoming mainstream, right? You know, his first rap song probably would have been what most people's first rap song was like rapper's delight by the sugar Hill gang in 79. And then everybody's second rap song was probably like Curtis blow the brakes in 1980. Well, you know, this is like when Prince is like starting to really get his career off the ground. And while there isn't a lot of rap in the world um, outside of New York or, you know, maybe a couple of other centers until I would say, you know, like right around the time this song would have been written around 85, 86, you know, then we start getting, you know, songs like The Message by Grandmaster Flash, Planet Rock uh, by African Bombada, you know, just all kinds of stuff just starts to kind of peek its head out and make some headway. And this is before rap really started to, you know, get, you know, diverse and really wild and in the mainstream. It was doing that on its own uh, within the culture, but it was not in the, on the radio like that. Anyhow, um, so by the time that Prince is recording this song in 87, you know, uh, we are starting to see some real headway with rap. And my impression <laughs> is that Prince was not a fan of that. Like, I don't, and not necessarily just saying he's not a fan of the form. He's not a fan of its success. And so the song lyrically refers to that and the way that he kind of, to me, lampoons what a rap song is, is really important here. It's, I mean, we'll get into it, of course, but like to me, there, there's no love lost here with Prince. And the Black Album is kind of an album of obsessions, right? Obsessions with a woman, obsessions with sounds, obsessions with rap, um, obsessions with jealousy, this kind of stuff. And so um, there's a lot of really kind of headspace work on this record. And dead on it is pretty much the most blatant, to me, the most blatant example of that on the record. Even in 1987, like when this song came out in 80 or was recorded in 87, this would have sounded almost like a dated rap song. This, this was supposed to be released in December of 87. <laughs> by, dis by 87, we were already starting to see the likes of Eric B and Rakim and Boogie Down Productions and Public yes. Enemy's debut album. So this this style of rap was already dated <laughs> in some way yeah. by late 87 that he was lampooning here. Yeah. This was like because rap was evolving so quickly because it was so brand new and I uh, had everywhere to go after, you know, the first forays into the genre. And so it was going to evolve so quickly that a song recorded or written and recorded in 85, 86 was going to sound dated by 87, 88 just was that's just how fast rap was moving 
And so even in that time frame, it sounds dated and it sounds like his rhymes are very simplistic, of course. Uh, he I mean, he's not he, I mean, he wasn't really to your point. I don't think he put a lot of time and effort into it. He was just trying to make simple rhyme patterns, basically lampooning, like you said, the genre or lampooning at least a certain style of rapping, a certain yeah. um, way of rapping, um, certain rappers that were in his mind, I guess, not really basically talking loud, saying nothing, you know, kind of stuff where he felt like, you know, the music should do more than just brag and boast. Uh, maybe that was some of his thought process behind it, too. Um yeah, I don't know. I'll, I'll, actually, I'll add that, um, you know, if you look at kind of the stuff that was happening at the time, um, you know, rap was still kind of finding its way musically, not lyrically. So, I mean, it was also doing it lyrically, but, you know, musically, it was still like a lot of it was, you know, a lot of the early rap was instrumental, right? People were playing instruments on early rap songs. Um, and you could debate whether or not that's actually good music or good mus musicianship. And I think Prince would have heard some of that and been like, what is this? Is this disco all over again? Whatever. But um, by the time that, you know, we get into like 86, let's say, you know, the year before he would have started recording this, you know, it becomes real sample heavy. Like it's the wild, wild west of the sampling era. And we don't have all the rules down yet. So people were just like ripping songs and doing all kinds of things and getting it on the radio, right? Mm -hmm. um and then too like rap had already started to kind of become very self-aware as well so for instance you know like the beastie boys comes out in 86 and they're kind of almost appearing to lampoon rap in a way once you realize who they are what they are and um and that's like one of the biggest records of the year at that point but yeah like you know run dmc has a certain cadence you know, and they're on the radio, Beastie Boys, that kind of thing, LL Cool J. Um, you know, they all have kind of this, you know, it's rap is still very much a party at that point. You know, it, mm -hmm. it begins to get political maybe like a year or two later in the mainstream. But um, that's the kind of stuff that he might have been exposed to because it was selling so well. Yeah. And yeah. so um, I think that, you know, we're definitely, I don't, we may get into who possible targets are, but I think that. <laughs> It starts with recognizing that Prince doesn't like something he cannot understand. He does not like things he cannot do. And so um, I think Dead On It is really a, has a lot to do with kind of looking at the landscape, as it were. I agree with that. And I think one, and I'm going to theorize now, I'm going to uh, offer my theory of who I think maybe Prince might have been either directly targeting. Um, maybe not in his lyrics so much as just, well, maybe somewhat in his lyrics, but there might have been some some spark because, you know, rap had been around for a handful of years already, at least in the mainstream. Rappers mm -hmm. like 79, as you referenced. So it's not like rap was brand, brand new in 86. Uh, mm -hmm. It had been around a little bit, but, you know, it was still it was still kind of on the underground for the most part. Or in certain um, certain parts of the country only people knew about it hadn't broken through completely but there was a rapper from philadelphia named schooly d um i'm assuming you're familiar yeah. with schooly d oh he so <laughs> schooly d is kind of known as you know the the grandfather of of gangster rap i mean he had that kind of uh semi-big hit psk what does it mean ice t has cited schooly d's uh, as being kind of like his inspiration for writing um, yep. Th what would be considered gangster rap with his debut album? So, you know, he he deserves credit for that. But on his date on Schoolie D's debut album in '85, there's a song called "I Don't Like Rock and Roll." This is um, an album that came out, like I said, in '85. So this would have been around the time frame. And the, in the intro to the song "I Don't Like Rock and Roll," he says something to the effect of, "What's up, man? The Saint Prince, the Saint Prince. It's Schoolie D, man. We rap." <laughs> and so he 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 calls Prince out by name in this song. I forgot song, about I that. Don't like rock and roll, and the song the lyrics of the song are really kind of kind of a uh, you know of a of a time when hip hop was very uh, what I what am I trying to say more a little bit of its homophobic nature. 
there's a oh, lot yeah, of references. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of references in this song citing, you know, rockers being looking like the F word. And, um, you know, he's he's basically calling out rockers for looking like women. I mean, take a look at a lot of the, the style of rock music in the 80s, long hair, frilly clothes. I mean, you know, Prince was kind of teased in some aspects about his wardrobe at the time as well. So it's not that surprising that a rapper, you know, who's basically irreverent towards that style of music because, you know, rap was its own thing. And what to, what did, what did new genres try to do? A lot of times build themselves up by, you know, kind of pointing out the differences between them and what is the old school or, or what has been more traditional music. Uh, you know, we have songs from like Ice Cube and, and other rappers in the late 80s, early 90s that try to tear apart, you know, like the Quiet Storm R&B, you know, because it's, it's, it's boring music and they don't say anything. And, and so I think Schooly D is doing a little bit of that here with this song, I Don't Like Rock and Roll. And just his his stance is rock sucks. Uh, they're a bunch of f words, and, um, and and he calls out Prince by name. He's the only one he calls out by name. I don't know. He could have called out a <laughs> lot of different artists in '85. I mean, Twisted Sister, uh, Def Leppard. There was big rock rockers at that time that he could have called out for gender bending. Boy George. Uh, but he calls out Prince. So Prince might have heard this. I don't know. Might have became aware of the song. Maybe not right when it was released, but sometime shortly after. And it was like, well, fuck this. I'm, <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna <laughs> to respond in my own way. Because the beat to Dead On It, to me, sounds eerily similar to Gucci Time, which was another yeah. Schooly D song off of the same album. They have, yeah. It has a lot of the same, same production style, same beat. You know, Schooly D's beats on that first album are very similar in my to my ears as what Prince did on Dead On It. I think that's fair. I don't know, but I'm I'm sticking fair. with it. <laughs> yeah. And then I'm too, like, you know, Prince was certainly uh, aware of how specifically, you know, black men were referring to him or perceiving him in that way. Right. So Schooly D is not a standout in the in the interpretation department here, um, although he put it to, to music. Mm -hmm. But Prince would have been obviously aware of that. And I mean, he references it in Bob George. Right. You know, skinny motherfucker with a high voice, this kind of thing, you know. So there's a lot of machismo launching back and forth. Right. Yeah. For sure. If Schooly D, again, probably wasn't alone and he was probably just echoing thoughts that a lot of people a lot of his a lot of his crew were thinking like these guys these cats are not where it's at you know we're we're real we're we're now the new the new thing hip hop's the new thing and we're the leaders of that but also it could have, a lot have just been again shock trying to shock you know who who's the big who's the big cat in 85 michael jackson or prince so who am i going to target you know he he had, he had two like targets he could have went after and Prince was a fairly easy target, I think, in 1985. He was everywhere. Plus, he was a little eccentric. His clothing choices, his, you know, mannerisms, all very eccentric to maybe somebody like Schooly D, who felt like, again, an easy target. Well, and I think that he probably liked Michael Jackson, and he probably wasn't a big fan of Around the World in the Day, right? So, Possibly, <laughs> yeah. 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 If that's the Prince that you're looking at when you write a song like that, then yeah, that you're gonna have problems. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, um, I think it would be a good time as any to start going through the lyrics. There's quite a a decent amount of lyrics, I should say. There's a decent amount of lyrics on this song, uh, in spite of them being maybe um, pretty simplistic. But we'll go through them and kind of point out things that we find interesting, or maybe some kind of funny ways. For, first thing I want to mention, and I'm sure you probably notice this as well scott as his performance of this song it sounds like he is like trying to enunciate every single letter every single syllable in these lines riding on my thunderbird on the freeway i turned on my radio to hear some music play i got a silly rapper talking silly shit instead and the only good rapper is one that's dead wait for it 
on it. <laughs> and I, I, I don't know if it's just me that I pick it up, but it sounds like he's really like, I don't know if he's doing that in a joking way. Like he's trying to enunciate so clearly because he's so used to doing that in his music, or if he's just kind of trying to offer a different, like, like, uh, I don't know, like a different take on rapping that is a little more nerdy. I don't know. I'm not exactly sure what he's trying to I do. I think there. it's definitely a shots fired situation, right? So he's definitely making fun of the what he perceives as the rap voice. Um, you know, it almost has, really, it almost has kind of this Fresh Prince cadence, you know? Um, yeah, Fresh Prince before it, Fresh Prince, yeah. Right, there's a little bit of the party to it in a way, but, but it's like, yeah, hmm. He, I mean, he, he just doesn't give it any respect here. He doesn't see anything to respect about the voice. And so I, and I think that it's telling that, you know, while we hear this voice in other Prince songs, it isn't doing the same kind of work. Or maybe it is, I don't know. But um, I think probably a, a more interesting parallel might be what voice does he use like when he's doing like, time songs or whatever um but it's interesting like it's it's a weird it's clearly a very weird voice clearly intentional clearly not um not digging itself in a way right it doesn't like itself (laughs) he sounds like he's like i mean i hate to say it but it sounds like he's trying to be like this really lame white guy rapping Mm. Uh, to my ears like he, it's almost like he's putting on this voice of just what the the stereotypical nerdy white guy <laughs> that's what it almost comes across to me um because this is not how he raps when he raps later on in songs in the you know the 90s he doesn't well, rap I in this manner in the well later on he develops a begrudging appreciation and then at some point he embraces it a little more right so absolutely down the line once he's done pissing all over hip hop, you know, and he starts to really listen to, I think other things that aren't just things that are on the radio or people are hipping him or he meets rappers um, and that kind of thing. Like, I don't know that he knows any rappers when he's recording this song. I don't know. Probably not. Right. Yeah. So, um, and if you, you know, look down the line, like, he can't, you know, he eventually learns how to rap. Like at this point, he doesn't know how to rap. Mm-hmm. He eventually learns how to do it, begins to write it, begins to dedicate himself to it a little bit. But at this point, like, so for instance, my favorite Prince rap song is um, Why Should I Do That When I Can Do This? Oh, like yeah. that's Prince actually trying to rap and doing it well and and not doing it about rap right it's actually trying to convey some other point and he's using rap to do that so rap at that point becomes a tool but here rap is a tool in a completely different (laughs) meaning right so yeah i mean we've all seen those like uh tv shows in the 80s and 90s and commercials where they get some out of touch older person to try to to rap to kind of um relate to the youth or and and usually they come off as corny. I mean, that's the intention of them is come to come off in the TV show or in the commercial as corny. And that's what Prince kind of comes off to me as in this. Like he's like it's he's an outsider attempting like this is my my first rap by Prince. You know, like he's just, it just doesn't come off as sincere. It doesn't come off as like he's put any effort into learning um you know cadences and proper flow tech you know techniques for flow and and how to make lines sound like they're like he's not just robotically reading them off of you know a sheet in front of him i don't know it just it does come across to me as corny and 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 that's just i guess my take but pe- people might like the song i don't know <laughs> uh i mean you can sure. like it and it'd still be corny right so <laughs> yeah, true <laughs> good point yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Prince claims his intentions for this song were misunderstood, that he wasn't necessarily dissing rap as a genre, that he was more dissing rappers that, like I kind of mentioned before, had nothing to say. Um, And he didn't, like, cite Schooly D in that case, or even anybody, any kind of rapper. He just said rappers who basically 
uh, had nothing to say was his i think his quote and this was later this was like in the 90s so this because this opening verse has really nothing to say riding my thunderbird on the freeway thunderbird of course I mean, he references thunderbird again and alphabet street on the next album so he pulls that reference out and refers to that car again uh turn my radio on so you kind of get the impression like he's Oh, what's this? What's this new genre I'm hearing? <laughs> oh, that sounds interesting. Talking sh- silly rappers, talking silly shit. So that just basically reiterates the comment that he made about having nothing to say. Like in his mind, what what are they talking about? They 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 have nothing to say to me that's you know intriguing or interesting. Didn't feel because he must not have heard the message. Obviously, he wasn't listening to anything that was that had something to say that you know had social commentary. He probably heard in his mind, you know, um, you know, like a I'm bad by LL Cool J or, you know, something like that, where it is just a braggadocio rhyme, which is can be can be dope as hell if it's done right. But maybe to Prince's mind, this this particular song just didn't sit right with them and he didn't understand what it was all about. Yeah. And, I, you know, and but the stuff that would have been hitting the radio at that time, you know, a lot of it. Not all of it, but a lot of it was, you know, the rap was not that deep. I mean, it's classic stuff, but it's not deep stuff, you know. So, you know, is the Fat Boys classic? Yes. Is it deep? No. Was it on the radio? Absolutely. You know, so, yeah. yeah. I mean, Prince wrote Crush, he wrote, not Crush, he wrote Holly Rock for Crush Group. What is that song? That song's all about bragging and boasting. Mm-hmm. So, so, I mean, it's a little, uh, it's being a little bit of hypocritical there, but. Whatever. Yeah, well, I think, you know, he reminds me of a lot of musicians who are really good at being a musician. And when they hear things like, like he reminds me of like a lot of, of a lot of jazz musicians where they're not in the stuff because they listen to it and they can figure it out and they see what it's doing. And they're like, well, that's easy. So I don't care about it. And so uh, but mostly jazz musicians don't then in turn try to write a rap song. Right. So <laughs> Prince, not a jazz musician. So there you go. Yeah, and I always found it funny when he uh, at the last line in the first verse, the only good rapper is the is one that's dead. And the dramatic pause on it, um, because again, that was obviously intentional for him to pause like that. So you'd think that you know the only there's only one good rapper and he's dead. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, clearly his 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 thoughts on the genre are laid out pretty pretty bare there in that first verse and especially in that line as well well the last two lines silly rapper talking silly shit and the only good rapper is one that's dead so the 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 phrase dead on it you know i have always kind of taken that to just mean um you know on you know on point or um you know somebody who is understands what it's all about or you know comes correct that kind of thing is that kind of your understanding of the phrase and what it means well, um, kind of. So, you know, we know that, um, that to me, it's a, it's a funk reference, right? It's a musical funk reference. And so he's like, you know, this is all about being on the one. This is about being on it. Um, it's certainly a phrase that you find in funk music, right? So, um, you know, I think he's just kind of doing a little wordplay here. Like, I get to say, you know, that rappers are dead or they should be dead. <laughs> And I also get to tie it back into what I really am talking about, which is musicianship, right? He, this is a song that is largely about craft. You know, he's suggest, you know, his issue with rap at this point isn't that it's gangster or that it's overly negative. It's that it is simple and not deep, you know, and not great in his opinion. Um, and I think the second verse will really reveal that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there really is much, isn't much of a chorus. Uh, he just says dead on it. And then, you know, there's some background line. Shall we go back? Let's go. And he goes right into the next verse. And the next verse is Negroes from Brooklyn play the bass pretty good, but the ones from Minneapolis play it like it ought to should. A magnum fro is better when you got a poof on it. And the to and fro is funky when the grease is dead on it. He says yeah. those lines pretty quickly. Um, so, I mean, he has a little bit of flow there <laughs> to get all those <laughs> words out in, in, a, in a short amount of time. But, yeah, those, that, those first two lines about Brooklyn, guys from Brooklyn play bass. 
but the ones from Minneapolis play like it ought to should. Of course, he's kind of repping his own. <laughs> he's repping himself, repping his town there by shouting out mm-hmm. Minneapolis, uh, which is another kind of um, hip hop trope from the time. Everybody, you know, rep their hoods, you know, Bronx, Brooklyn, Queens, Manhattan. Usually it was <laughs> one of the five boroughs, typically just right. four. <laughs> Staten Island didn't get a lot of a lot of shine until Wu-Tang came along. But um, but yeah, that's kind of what I get from that. It's like, hey, I, I'm a I'm a real musician. Uh, and it's not just me. There's a lot of cats in Minneapolis that can play music. And there's there's a lot of us out there. What can you do? What, what can you what can you rappers from Brooklyn do? Um, well, yeah. And to kind of tie into that first line, you know, Negroes from Brooklyn play the bass pretty good. You know, this kind of harkens back to the point I was making about how a lot of early rap, you know, was being played by musicians, right? It wasn't sample heavy. Um, Curtis Blow was playing musicians or he had musicians playing. You know, the Fat Boys record is not a sample record. It's a played record, you know. So there are bass players, you know, um, bass players on early rap songs. There are keyboard players on early rap songs they're you know largely playing over drum machines but you know all the other stuff is a lot of it was instruments and so mm-hmm. somebody like prince hearing that i mean that's almost entirely where this line probably comes from right it's like yeah. oh my god i heard your song and your bass is horrible you know <laughs> yeah yeah and so he's being kind by saying, play the bass pretty good. <laughs> he probably in his mind is thinking, this is shit. <laughs> I can, well, I can play a lot maybe, better. Right. Like he probably would have heard a lot of this stuff in a club and people love that music. And so, you know, I think you got to kind of tip your hat when you see the room moving, even if you don't get it, something is happening. Yeah. And yeah. so maybe that's a tip to that kind of thing. Who knows? I don't know. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the ends justified the means. I mean, if, if it got bodies moving, then I guess the bass doesn't have to be played impeccably and uh, it just needs to, 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 you know, groove and get people going. The last two lines in this verse um, are interesting, I guess, just from an outsider's perspective, because I, I, when I hear Afro, poofs i don't know what an afro poof is i don't know what an afro puff is are they synonymous in your mind <laughs> no uh those are two different things so basically okay. what Prin- prince takes a really interesting uh turn here right because now we're not talking about music at all now we're just talking about fashion yeah and so so to be clear for our white listeners so <laughs> thank you so Call there's like an the afro like there's an Afro puff, which is like when you bunch up your hair into an actual ball, but that's not what he's referring to. Uh, okay. What he's saying here is a Magnum fro is better when you got a poof on it. So basically what he's saying is, you know, having an Afro is dope, but you got to get that extra poof into it. You got to get it really blown out like oh. he would have had like on his first couple of records, right? And so, and then the next line, and the to and fro is funky when the grease is dead on it. It's like, you know, to kind of, sometimes when you want to get that Afro doing the right thing, you got to put some stuff on it, grease, some spray, whatever you got to do to it to get that poof doing what it needs to do. So that's basically what he's kind of talking about here. And, and when he's saying the to and fro is funky when the grease is dead on it, you know, that's kind of like, in my opinion, that's always been a, uh, reference to head nodding to music, right? So when you when you nod and your and your fro is big enough and it's doing the right things, it goes to and fro, but it does yeah. that best when it's you know when the grease is on it or whatever. That's and so I don't know what he's doing. I mean, I know what he's saying. I don't know why he's saying it. <laughs> so there's right. that. I think that okay. might be like were we at the club last night? If you were at the club with me last night, you know what I'm talking about. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks for clarifying. I've heard, I've heard, blow, I've heard of froze being blown out, but I had never heard of poofed froze. Oh, yeah. And by the end of his life, you know, he was right back at it, right? He had a madam fro oh, at the end. For sure. For right? sure. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah. So again, I mean, they're just like, kind of like lines and I guess they, they make sense when you're kind of thinking of it from the context of um, like out at a club or, you know, party and dancing or whatever. Uh, but yeah, they have nothing to do necessarily with the overarching concept of this song. He's just, 
you know, putting some some lines together to make a rhyme, I think. Uh, the refrain is, again, dead on it. Shall we go back? So, we, again, there's not much here going on in the chorus or the refrain. So now in verse three, he he raps in a little different way. He, he starts out a bit slower. See, the rapper's problem, and he has like these weird pauses, usually stem from being tone deaf. Pack the house, then try to sing. There won't be no one left. Parking lots on fire. Brothers peeling out of the town. They say in disgust, they sing in their guts. Rapping done let us down. You got to be dead on it. Uh, so again, this is speaking, I think, speaking to where he f- feels like the musicality isn't up to snuff here <laughs> um, with rappers. They're being, you know, their big problem is that they're tone deaf is what he's saying. And I, I find this funny because he's kind of calling rappers out for not being able to sing, but that's not what they're trying to do. I mean, that's not really what their intention is. Like, yeah, a rapper can't sing, but that he's, is he trying to sing? So if you think like uh, going to a rap concert and, and if they can't sing, that's a negative. I, I, don't, I don't know what he's trying to say here. <laughs> like all these all these guys are going to this rap concert expecting these rappers to be able to to hold a note. And they're all peeling out of the parking lot because they can't sing. <laughs> I'm not sure what if he's ever been to a rap concert and that's what he's expecting. Pretty funny to me. <laughs> Yeah, this this ver- this third verse is a bit of a mess, and um, and I feel like I don't know if he just kind of ran out of ideas at this point, or he had made his case, and now he's just kind of like riffing. It, it's impossible to know, but it, it might even be something very specific that he saw that he's referencing, because Maybe. as you mentioned, you know, yeah, we're, you know, we're certainly not seeing a lot of singers in rap at this point. You know, so it's it's really hard to figure out where he's going here. But, you know, I think that it's probably if you want to apply a theory to it, you could say, well, you know, he's just kind of doing what rappers do. They just kind of fall apart and they just kind of aren't really saying anything and it just turns into whatever. And so, yeah, he I don't know if he's freestyling this part. I don't know what's happening here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. None of us really do. But. I just find it funny because I I just keep I get in my mind like when I hear this verse, what Prince might have thought happened at rap concerts because he just wasn't you know intimately familiar with going to them and just thought maybe well what do they do they can't just go up on stage and just rap the whole time so I'm sure they probably try to sing or you know play some music and uh, and uh, you know assuming that they can't really sing like me or sing like you know any of my contemporaries who do this for a living they're gonna sound like you're going to sound horrible and people are going to, and I, I I like how he, how he um, gives us the, the visual of just everybody, you know, tires screeching out the parking lot because it sounds so bad. (laughs) I just, (laughs) I just find it humorous. They say in disgust, they sing in their guts, rapping doesn't let us down. So um, again, he's, that's just him calling out the genre again, calling out the genre for not, not being what he thinks it should be maybe or what he thinks like it could be and they're just kind of wasting their wasting the the talents well maybe not the talents but wasting the opportunity they're given to to do something and say something and be something yeah and and it's also possible like you know there was a little bit of like sing songginess in hip hop, like maybe in the hooks or something like that, you know, even in like rapper's delight, you know, which would have been like, you know, just a little sing songy chanty kind of thing going on. You know, that happens at rap concerts, you know, that happened in some songs, you know, and yeah. I don't know if he would have encountered that so much, but enough to make a comment on it. But it's certainly like, if, if that's what he's referring to, it's a little bit like, you know, killing a cockroach with a bazooka. You know what I'm saying? It's like, yeah, that's not really what we're trying to do, man. So just calm down, man. Yeah. I it, actually, when you said that, it reminded me of the, the Slick Rick, Dougie Fresh, the show, Lottie Dottie. There was yeah. Slick, Slick Rick tries to sing a little bit in those songs. And, yeah. you know, it's, it's not yeah. it's not great singing. <laughs> so Prince might have heard that. And like these guys, these guys, they can't sing. What are they doing? Well, you know, when like, you know, like, you know, when Slick Rick does that, you know, 
he's doing something. He's not trying to sing. He's making a commentary as well, you know? Yeah. But if you don't care about rap, you don't care that that's what he's doing. (laughs) All you hear is the out of tune singing and that's Mm -hmm. all you take away from it. Yeah. Uh, Anything else about the third verse you wanted to bring up, Scott? No. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) And I'm not going to repeat the refrain because again, the refrain chorus is just dead on it. Verse four, (laughs) verse four is where I just start scratching my head and I, I just laugh because I, it's just so absurd. All the sisters like it when you lick them on the knees. Don't believe me? Do it once, then stop. They'll be begging. Please, please, please. Shooby doo wah, dead on it. What does that have to do with the funk? Nothing. But who's paying the bills? If you don't want to lick my knees, I'm sure your mama will. <laughs> it's like, oh Jesus Christ. What is he what is he doing with this verse, God? <laughs> he's me. just giving up at this point. So. <laughs> Like he's truly like if if you want to say that Prince is exhibiting any hip hop value at all, he's freestyling here. Like he's just off the rails at this point. Um, and I mean, and he he basically admits it by the end of the verse when he says, "What does this have to do with the funk? Nothing." You know, so exactly <laughs> right. Let me just start yeah. talking about something I know, which is licking women on knees. You know, so yeah, he's just basically giving up on the song at this point. <laughs> yeah the whole licking on the knees is just out of left field um it's just so so absurd and it's just so random uh and then he at the end with like a kind of like a pseudo mama joke if you don't want to lick my knees i'm sure your mama will <laughs> yes and he loves a good mama joke but this is not a good mama joke <laughs> no it's not it's not a good mama joke at all and it's just kind of gross actually <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah, but I laugh out loud when I hear it just because it's just so WTF. Yeah, and he's doing so many things in this one verse, right? Like he's doing like the little kind of talky thing, but then he actually tries to sing the please, please, please lines. And it's like, dude, what are we doing here? You know, so whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so, like when he says the line, what does it have to do with the funk? I just think like he's thinking like what what the fuck am I talking about? <laughs> let's get back to let's get back to what I'm. But the whole point of the song was, I guess, which was to kind of express my dis, displeasure with certain rappers or you know the burgeoning genre as it stands in 1986. But mm-hmm. anyway, um, yeah. So if people like looking other people on the knees, you might get you know some enjoyment out of this fourth verse. But otherwise, <laughs> it's just funny. <laughs> <laughs> all right because we're dead on it de- 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 dead on it and of course you know that's that's another one of those 80s rap kind of like people who don't know the genre and they try to rap they, they do that stuttering thing like, yeah. what, 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 what's going on and that's what people who <laughs> don't know don't know the genre that's what i would hear i remember like people would make fun of rap that's how they would make fun of it they would do the yeah. stuttering thing and they do the wicked wicked, you know, like the record scratch and shit. And yeah, like this guy, clearly you have not really listened to rap if that's all you're kind of taking away from it. Yes. But he, he does that here too. He does the the stuttering. He's telling on bit. himself, right? He's telling yeah. on himself. So. Yeah, he kind of is. <laughs> um, verse five. Well, there's some la la li la's. You know, this is where he kind of goes into his um, falsetto singing voice. But there's nothing really to say other than just he. Does the la 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 la, and um, then he goes into another verse. Like even when you think this is this song is too long, I mean, it's like almost five minutes long, and he doesn't it doesn't need to be this long. He doesn't need to have verse after verse after verse. I think to your point, I think he's just kind of freestyling, you know, just putting stuff out there. Because the next verse is my bed's a coffin, Dracula hasn't got shit on me, my nickname's hell's a poppin'. I'm badder than the Wicked Witch. And that kind of sounds like a sample there. I don't know if it really is or not. I got a gold tooth. Costs more than your house. I got a diamond ring on four fingers. Each one the size of a mouse. This is just off the dome, I feel like. I feel like he's literally just bringing stuff up that, you know, he's just coming up with the uh, top of his head. Yes. A um, couple <laughs> things. <laughs> uh, you know, Prince, uh, the, the Dracula references... 
kind of funny. Um, like, you know, clearly he has an affinity for Dracula. Dracula appears, or at least a vampire of some type appears a couple times in his life, right? Under the cherry moon, that kind of thing. The uh, Badder Than a Wicked Witch is ripped out of a Sheila E track that he wrote to Holly Rock, right? So, mm -hmm. um, But is it a sample? Because it doesn't sound like Prince singing. It sounds like a I woman don't... now. I don't I don't recall if it's a sample. That's a great question. Yeah, uh, I can't tell. I can't tell. Somebody knows. I think he know. just threw it in, but it's definitely a Holly Rock line. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, like, you know, the gold tooth costs more than your house. Diamond ring of four fingers, each one the size of a mouth. Like, uh, <laughs> I, you know, it's funny. He's like right on the precipice with rap here. You know, like at this point, like rappers are wearing like really heavy chains and this kind of thing. Um, four fingered but, rings, yep, yep, right, right. Um, but it's nowhere near as bad as it's going to get at this point, right? Yeah, so I mean, it's, it's, st it's still pretty subdued, like he, one mm -hmm. gold chain, right? You know, one, one big four finger ring, not like, right, yeah, it's not the bling era, it's definitely not the bling right. era yet, right? And then in a couple of years, we're about to make switches to like African medallions, so you know, whatever, Prince, thanks, you know. But he, you know, that's at least an observation. What's interesting to me is that we're calling these things verses and they're like four lines long. <laughs> you know, so, yeah, yeah. Like they're really just lines. Yeah. Yeah. It's like technically it's a verse, but it's like he's just kind of throwing stuff out there now. I think almost as it occurs to him. Right. Mm -hmm. That's what it feels like. It really truly feels like that. Um, my nickname's Hell's a Poppin. <laughs> I don't know. Mm. I, I don't know. I don't know what that means. Right. <laughs> it, it, <laughs> um, okay. So yeah, uh, those last those last couple lines though. I got a gold tooth, cost more than your house, diamond ring, four fingers, size of a mouse. That is a very clear reference to what he feels like is the the blatant materialism. That's kind of, but it isn't. To your point, it's not even as kind of um, abrasive as it's going to get, or blatant as it's going to get in hip hop at some point, but. You know, that's that was the style. You see, like the magazines, hip hop magazines from the back in the day, and they, you know, there's there's like a uniform almost that you know rappers are supposed to have, and they usually involve some sort of gold chain, big rings, and so that's what he's kind of lampooning here. Um, let's see, we got some more la 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 la's. The really the only more lyrics is this last. We'll call it a verse because, for lack of a better word, uh. But it's it's just random lines. Wait now, hang up, dial tone on the three. You know, you know, I'm busy, too skizzy, can't nobody fuck with me. <laughs> what does <is> skizzy? <laughs> what does skizzy mean, Scott? What does skizzy mean? Do you have any idea? Nope. I don't. Okay. <laughs> I, was, I was hoping that you were like, dude, come on, that's a common. No, I a mean, common I, word. listen, I am doubling down on Prince just making stuff up at this point. So. And that yeah. includes words, right? So, you know, he's mm -hmm. just kind of going through the Rolodex at this point and just kind of throwing the kitchen sink in here. Yeah, it kind of feels like a precursor to like Snoop's full shizzle, you know, kind of speak in the 90s. Too skizzy. So he's like thinking of a word, but it has to rhyme or has to kind of sound, I don't know, unique or like almost has to sound like he's uh, described like it's a descriptive word. But nobody mm. knows what he's describing. It I'm sounds like a placeholder, actually, right? So you know how sometimes, like in rappers, do this as a lot, actually. You know, um, where you know when they get a new beat or whatever, and they're just kind of like trying to figure out how they want it to go, and they'll they'll kind of do a thing. Chuck D talks about this, and he'll just be like, you know, such and such and such, blah 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 blah. I'm busy too skizzy, da 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 da. Yeah, and then yeah. the intent is to go back later and actually put real language in there. But uh, Prince, in this case, has decided this song was not possibly worth that. <laughs> <laughs> it's not worth it. No, <laughs> it it isn't. It isn't worth it at this point. I think too skizzy just fits just fine for, for, as far as like what we've heard so, thus far in the song and the amount of effort that I think he's put into the lyrics. So. <laughs> Skizzy actually makes more sense, and I'm glad he left it. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, then we've got, you know, basically, I'm dead on it. shooby doo -wah, dead on it. <laughs> so he even tries to throw some, like, uh, doo-wop language in there for shits and giggles. 
Um, yeah, I mean, that's pretty much the song. He says, you know, does the da -da dang dang dead da dang dead on it, you know, doing the, the stuttering thing again. Um, but yeah, it's almost like a five minute song. And this song could have easily, you could have easily gotten his point across in three minutes or less, ideally. But no, nope, mm -hmm. it's almost a five minute song. Uh, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> for me, dead on it, I don't, it's not a song that I like seek out like ever uh it's it's funny at times but it, it i'm definitely never going to play dead on it to anybody who i'm introducing prince to especially in 2021 when you know hip-hop <laughs> has, has evolved so much over the past few decades and because even as a throwback to like mid to early 80s rap it's not even really very good for that um and I'm being very critical. I apologize to people who like this song, but I don't really like this song. I just will be, <laughs> be up front. And I, I almost never say that. Like, I usually can find value in most Prince songs. Um, but I, I, I do not like this song. I don't like it. I would, um, the only thing I guess I would add to that, I also do not go to this song, like, for enjoyment or recreation. Um, but I do occasionally pull it out for the purposes of scholarship and academic discussion, because I think the song is very instructive, not musically to be clear, uh, but uh, in terms of kind trying to contextualize Prince and certain decisions that he would have been making at that time or influences or things that he would have been kind of tapping into, this song is extremely important in an academic sense. Right. So if you want to talk about what did Prince think about black music or what did he think about rap music or what, you know, because those are two different conversations. Right. And mm -hmm. both of those are kind of happening in this song in a way. But also um, it, it shows that Prince was not perfect. He had blind spots. Right. So he's making a commentary right here in this moment in 87, early 87. Uh, about a genre of music that was already deeper and wider and more diverse than he was aware of that he was making fun of, right? So clearly he didn't really sit down with Grandmaster Flash's album, you know, um, and that kind of thing. So, you know, so he has some blind spots here. And I think that it's telling, right? It's like, okay, we see that you're aware of rap, but I think we can kind of tell how you're aware of rap. And that's very telling. And, and I think that if you're going to look at Prince long-term, this song is very key. I think it's a, it's a linchpin song in some ways. It's not a good song. It's not a, but it's an important song, which is not to say anybody should put it in their mix, right? That's not the purpose of this song. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I do appreciate you, uh, bringing to light that aspect of this song's importance because i mean every every prince song you know can be important to somebody whether or not they enjoy listening to it or appreciate it as a bridge between point a and point b or point a and point z and in this case it is an early early hip-hop song from prince before he kind of understood the genre understood what its intentions were understood where it could go and it would take a couple more years there's stories out there about him being introduced to Chuck D, of course, to somebody he collaborated with later and, um, you know, kind of figuring out, OK, so rap can be more than just, you know, look at the look at the size of my uh, my gold chain. And, you know, I've, I'm the baddest, better than a wicked witch. It could do more than just brag and it can do more than just boast and it can do more than just have like really simple, you know, you know, drum machine beats, you know, the the. The technique that would it would take to create songs that would come out just a couple of years later, you know, producers like, you know, Marley Marl and Bomb Squad and uh, some of those, you know, Eric B. They were producing, making beats for the hip hop songs that would, you know, leave a song like Dead on It in the dust from a from a technical standpoint, and that's why I feel like this song, as outdated as it sounds. To your point, I think, you know, you bring up a very good point about it being a, an interesting song from the perspective of where was Prince's head at when it comes to 
a new genre and how he was accepting or maybe not so accepting of that before he understood it. And from a scholarship standpoint, dead on it's important. So, yes. Do I like it? No. But it, was it fun to talk about today? Yes, it was. <laughs> it was <laughs> I enjoyed talking about this song because I usually don't talk about the song with anybody because I usually just pretend it doesn't exist. So uh, <laughs> I, I thank you for agreeing to join me on this episode, Scott. Um, any final thoughts besides the one you've already made, which was very eloquently stated? Uh, not really. Uh, I think that it's a kind of just a little footnote here. You know, when he wrote this song and recorded it in 87, didn't release it. I think it's very telling that, you know, like his favorite, what I assume is like one of his favorite rappers, Chuck D and Public Enemy all together, um, you know, they drop their, you know, perhaps greatest record the next year. And if you believe the stories, um, you know, when Prince hears Fight the Power, he starts to change his opinion on uh, rap music. So um, I'm glad that happened. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And and that's why I think a lot of people f- cite the song or maybe think that people are wrong about Prince not enjoying hip hop. And that's not what the song was about. Um, no, I just think he changed his mind and everybody has the, uh, you know, has the ability to do that and has the right to do that. What he felt about hip hop in 86, 87 doesn't mean that's how he was going to stay. You know, that wasn't going to be his opinion for the rest of his life. And it clearly wasn't. So yes, he decided to embrace rap later. That's cool. I'm glad he did. Um, but doesn't take away how he felt about it at the time he wrote the song and recorded it. So agreed. All right, Scott. So that brings us to the end of the episode. Um, where can people find your work? So they can just hit up my uh, website at scottwoodswrites.net, um, or they can just find me on all the social medias. I'm real easy to find. I'm just the black guy in the Doctor Who scarf. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much for being on the show again. My name is Jason Brenninger. This has been the Press Rewind Prince Lyrics podcast. You can find the show at Press Rewind Pod on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. I'm uh, active on social media, especially Twitter, but I try to be active on all the sites in case you're not on or on one and not at the others. You can also find the show now on YouTube, so check it out there. I also post um, other Prince music when I can, if I come across it and it doesn't get blocked. So check it out, and until next time, thank you very much, and goodbye. Goodbye.